Good morning, Boridan, a very warm welcome to morning worship in the parish of Castle Churung Gosainen. Today we mark the baptism of Christ, and it's great to have your company. Today I'm joined by Ben Jones, our ordinant, who's training with us in the parish and due to be ordained a deacon in June. If you've been to church recently, many of you will have had a chance to meet with Ben. If not, in this morning service, he'll be reading for us and then leading our intercessions. It's great to have his company. As we begin our worship then, let me read the special prayer of the church, the collect for the baptism of Christ. Eternal Father, who at the baptism of Jesus revealed him to be your Son, anointing him with the Holy Spirit, grant that we who are born again by water and the Spirit may rejoice to be called your children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. 
and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. May I speak and may you hear in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we've just begun a new year and already the headlines are quite negative and pessimistic. We've got news of COVID and new variants, Omicron and the like, rising infection rates and people full of anxiety. We've got parts of the world still in crisis because of war and people suffering the world over. A refugee crisis as a result. And even questions closer to home about the integrity of our own leaders and the decisions that they make. When we hear of challenges like these, we're always inclined to be negative. We never hear the positive sides of the story, the story about unseen heroes or heroines determined to stand up and to make a difference. One such story was the story of King Christian X of Denmark. He was an interesting man, a bit of an autocrat. He wasn't particularly fond of democracy. But during World War II, he decided to make a stand against German occupation. He would often ride every day on his horse Jubilee without a groom or a bodyguard through some of the areas in his kingdom to make the point that he disputed German occupation and that the sovereignty over that country was in fact his. He was a monarch too who decided to take a stand with the Jewish people against Hitler and German occupation. It said that actually one of the things that he would have been prepared to do was wear the Star of David, to stand in solidarity with the Jews who were suffering under Hitler's cruel dominion. He didn't actually do that, but his diary makes very clear that if they were forced to do that in his territory, he would have worn the Star of David and stood alongside them. The story, I think, is particularly appropriate when we come to think about Jesus' baptism, which is in the Gospel today. All of the events recorded in the Gospel are interesting, but this one is particularly interesting because it always poses the question, why did it need to happen at all? You see, John the Baptist was proclaiming a baptism of the repentance of sins. Through undergoing the cleansing of baptism, a candidate would determine by the grace of God to change his or her ways, to cast aside those things that stood in opposition in their own lives against the loving purposes of God. Baptism was a, a rite of conversion. It signalled a change in attitude. And the word in Greek, metanoia, literally means turning around, making a different decision, living a different life and embracing different priorities. The reason why Jesus' baptism is a topic of contention and question is because, in a sense, there was no need for it to happen. Jesus' ways were perfect. So why was he baptised in the first place? Listen to St Peter. He wrote to Christians who were struggling and he said this, It's to your credit, being aware of God, that you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure, if you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, there is no credit in that. But if you endure when you do right and you suffer for it, you have God's approval. For this you can be called, because Christ suffered with you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he didn't return the abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to those whose, whose judgments were just. 
He himself bore our sins in his body, the cross, so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his words, we have been healed. Jesus was without sin. And so the question arises, why did he need to be baptised in the first place? Because he had nothing to repent of. No sins that needed forgiveness. The church has always believed, though, that Jesus was baptised not because he needed forgiveness of any sin, but because he stood in solidarity with us and our broken humanity. Just as King Christian X was prepared to stand in solidarity with the Jews as they suffered under Hitler's rule. It was a radical act then of identification. It was one that brought Jesus close to us, not so that his particular sin might be forgiven, but so that he would stand in radical solidarity with us. Indeed, as the first century saint, Saint Maximus of Turin explains, perhaps someone would say, he who is holy, why did he need to be baptised? Pay attention, therefore. Christ is baptised not that he may be sanctified in the water, but that he himself might sanctify the water and by his own purification may purify those streams which he touches. For when the Saviour is washed, then, all ready for our baptism, all water is cleansed and the fount purified, that the grace of the font may be administered to the people that come thereafter. Christ therefore takes a lead in baptism so that Christian people might follow him with confidence. His baptism then was a radical act of, sanctif of, of solidarity with us, with our brokenness, with our sinful human nature that continually rebels against God and his loving purposes. It's a mystery that Jesus can be both fully God and fully man. He didn't need to be baptised, but we do. He didn't need forgiveness from his sins, but we do. He didn't need to turn away from those things in his own life that were lived out in rebellion against God, but we do. Because of his love for us, he chose to delve down into our human story, into its complexity and its mess. He wasn't a God that was standoffish. He was a God right there in the middle of things. A God who was involved. A God who offers us a very real example of his love. When he was baptised, he had the gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift of the Holy Spirit that affirmed who he was and empowered him to do what came next, to fulfil his earthly ministry and to make God's loving purposes known to us. Jesus is our example. So we shouldn't simply be satisfied with the baptism of water. We shouldn't simply want to get the job done and then to carry on with life in our own strength, as if nothing has changed. We need to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit, his strength and guidance, and his conviction to set aside those things in our own lives that come between us and God. We live as freedom people, as baptised people, in the knowledge that all our sins have been forgiven, but we also need to actively choose every single day not to take that forgiveness for granted, but to live in the light of it. We are, yes, baptised, but we must remember the implications of that. And part of that is to live in solidarity with others 
just as Jesus lived in solidarity with us. Choosing to come alongside those who've fallen, those who've fallen short, to encourage them, to inspire them, to build them up, to see that there is a new and better way. Mindful that no sin is beyond God's forgiveness and his unconditional love. Not to look down upon them, to judge them, or to make them feel in any way unworthy. It's about choosing together in the power of the Spirit to build a community that stands alongside people by offering radical hospitality, not just to the people who are like us, but to people who are profoundly different to us. It's about choosing every single day to care for those who are in need and to see their need, responding to that need. It's about loving those who hurt and those whose lives are stricken by grief. And as individuals, it's about making everyday choices that set us aside as different. Words that are life-giving and encouraging. To let our words and our ways be words and ways of kindness and peace. To be quick to forgive and to be at peace with one another. Because, as C.S. Lewis once put it, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God in his great love has forgiven the inexcusable in us. It means to choose to build friendships with those who might otherwise not even have had the time of day from us, mindful that it's our job to make them feel as if they are loved, that they count, that they are valued and precious in God's sight. And it's about sharing the good news of Jesus with other people so that they might grow as disciples and encounter that incredible life-changing love that has had an impact on us and changed our lives. It's that radical solidarity with others that makes Jesus really attractive. Whilst Jesus always gets it right, sad sadly, the church, that's you and me, very often fails. Whether through ignorance, or through apathy, or through simply deciding that we can't do better. Imagine if we took these things more seriously. Imagine if we chose to more fully live out our baptism alongside other people in our community. Imagine if the reality of our baptism were to become more real in our lives. Think about the impact that we'd have and think about how attractive the community that we seek to build would truly be. I hope that you'll experience more of God's Spirit in your life. Choose to live in the light of your baptism and alongside me and others, seek to build that community that is well and truly the Church of God, an attractive community in the world, but not of the world. Amen.
Jesus calls us out of darkness into his marvellous light, washed clean by the waters of baptism. Let us pray that we may live the life to which he has called us. Lord Jesus, eternal word, proclaimed as the Christ by John the forerunner, hear us as we pray for all who proclaim your word, praying for your church throughout the world, and especially for the church in Wales. We pray for the bench of bishops, our Archbishop Andrew John, that they may be faithful stewards of your holy mysteries and faithful pastors of your flock. We pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit on this land of Wales, that our hearts may be set aflame with love for you and for our neighbours, that your kingdom may be here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, baptising with the Spirit and with fire, strengthen us to withstand all the trials of our faith, and when it may appear that all is dark and there is no way out, let us remember that you are the light in the darkness, and that it is in serving you that we can find perfect freedom, and that you can grant us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, bringing forgiveness to all who repent, teach your church dependence on your grace. Because God was merciful, he saved us through the water of rebirth and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. But through sin, we have fallen away from our baptism. Let us return to the Lord and renew our faith in his promises. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, fulfillment of the promises of old, give hope to all who suffer or are ignored. We pray for those who have no one to pray for them, for those who are sick in mind, body or spirit. Surround them with your love and comfort them in their afflictions. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, bringer of hope, share with all the faithful the riches of eternal life. We pray for those known to us who have died. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and may light perpetual shine upon them. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, in you the Father makes us and all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Amen.
Once again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged during the service, that you've seen Jesus a little bit more clearly, that you've learned to love him more dearly and to follow him more nearly. As we begin a new week, please remember that we're here for you and if there's any support that we can offer, practical or spiritual, then do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. But now as another week begins, let me then pray for God's blessing upon you, your family and those that you love. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Bendith diw holl y lliog, y tad yma bar y sbryd glan, a fwn eich blith, ac adrigo gyda chi'n wastad. Amen.